good morning by you, I think, Kirsten. It's uh, yes, Denmark. Yes. It's morning. Thank you for joining me on the Red Hot Truth today. It's um, always so wonderful to speak to people who live internationally. And you are the first guest I've interviewed from a Scandinavian country, which I'm very, very excited about because, um, yeah, just I love diverse viewpoints. So, first of all, welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm so honored. It's so exciting. We've already had um, the penis discussion this morning, so that's out of the way. Thank goodness. Sure. <laughs> um, so, what I um, we were just talking about it. Um, how this is now one of the most exciting times ever for us women because we have so asked for the old system to make room for us. And I have always said to women, forget the old system. It's, it's not designed for women and for the feminine. How about we create a new system? And I was often contemplating how would that even happen, you know, with such an ingrained system. And yet here is the opportunity. And I don't think, well, we certainly didn't expect it. And two, we, we certainly aren't quite as ready as we thought we would be. So um, today's interview is just about exploring femininity, feminine leadership, and how we can really go ahead and create the world that we want to see. And I know that this is something that you have been looking into for a few years and you've been, you know, teaching. Um, and I know that you've also had a goddess school to explore this amazing topic with other women. So tell me, how did that journey start for you? I have to rewind the film a very, very long time back um, because it started... I guess it started back in back in school uh, because I grew up with three brothers mm -hmm. and one sister, and uh, I grew up in the seventies. And we were told there's no difference between girls and boys, but I sensed there was a big difference. My brothers were thinking, feeling, operating in very different ways than my ways. So I was like, "That's not true. That we are alike." that we're, you know, there's no difference. I really grew up feeling there's a big difference. And I was puzzled about it because I was told by society there is no difference, we're all alike. But I could see, um, it, it seemed like their brain was different than, than my brain. They, 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 they were, uh, their, their skills or their natural skills, their innate skills were different than mine. And this became um, very apparent when I started working in businesses and I could see that there was a very big difference between one, how women, men and women um, were working and, and two, how they were perceived. So we were not alike. Um, to give you an example, um, I worked as a TV host at a certain time and um, when we were doing the show, you know, we had to produce the show and get ideas for the show and so on and so on. And the women would show up, you know, in ironed, <laughs> ironed clothes, well prepared, 10 ideas written down to prepare for the meeting. They had seen our show, they had done the critique and they had uh, suggestions for improvement and they had prepared ideas and they had researched. And the men arrived and looked like somebody you, you just took out of a, like the tumble dryer. <laughs> and <laughs> and they would sit down and they had not seen the show because they didn't want to bother and they had not prepared because you know who wants that who, who, who wants to bother doing that and then they would just say one or two ideas and the editor-in-chief said yes that's what I'm gonna do I was like what 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 happened and I asked my um I asked my more experienced professional girlfriends, you know, who had been in, in, in corporate life for a little bit longer than, than me. And I said, what, what's going on here? And they said, oh, Kirsten, don't you see, if you want to succeed in business, if you want to succeed in your professional life, you have to act like the men. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, oh, okay. So I realized if I, if I want to uh, compete in the professional world, I have to participate in this competition one, two, three, who's best at being a man? Mm. 
Mm. And I'm like, if I'm if I participate in that competition, I will always, by design, be number two. Yeah. So I exited that competition and and said, I want to only compete with being the best version of me, because that's a competition I can actually win. So I exited and I became an entrepreneur, and that's um, very many years ago. It was like when I was 26. Oh, so, oh, like only a few years ago. Just recently, you mean? <laughs> recently, well, that's, that's like a century or, or two ago. Uh, and since I created, I, I, I actually employed the feminine skill of creating my, my own professional life. Mm-hmm. I've created a zillion jobs for myself. And every time I get a little bit bored with one job, I give myself a promotion. Oh, I and love I, that. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, so that's, it keeps me it keeps me uh, very stimulated and very excited and very uh, engaged with my work. I never look back. I never it's, I never ever wish that I was still uh, in that old world because I was like, no, I create my new world. Yes, I love that. I love that so much. So um, this is so interesting to me that in a country that promotes equality and the idea that irrespective of male or female, there's equal opportunities, right? And and then that you still experience that. And so it's interesting to me that even in the country or in in the part of the world that promotes equality, the system is not geared up for equality. So even though the words may say that and even though um, the opportunities may be equal for men and women, the systems give more towards the way the masculine works or the way men work. And therefore, the women don't really have a chance, as you say, unless they start behaving like men. Yeah, it's not that the women don't have a chance, but if you, yeah, if you want to... It's been like that hitherto. I think things are changing very much now. Um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a mystery that we, we have a term, the Nordic mystery. Yeah. And the Nordic mystery is that we are the most equal countries on the planet. And we still don't see an equal amount of male and female leaders. How come? And my take on it, I actually wrote a whole entire enormous, humongous book about it. Well, the future is feminine. Oh, no, I mean, me. look at this. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But uh, I, I wrote a book about it because I really wanted to uh, know the truth about this. And um, the thing is that it's so many elements that, that need, so many knobs that need to be turned in order for equity, real equity to happen. And, and the main one is the root cause for this inequity problem that we see all over the world. And the root cause is that we systematically for the last a few thousand years, I would say, but but let's just talk about the last hundred years. We have systematically undervalued the feminine energy and overestimated the masculine energy. So we, we, we have we have this as a root cause, this yeah. imbalance. Yeah. And that affects everything. So we can we can we can create we can try to to can create uh, uh, systems to promote equity like well why don't we create mentor programs for women or why don't we why don't we invite women to speak at the table and, and create awards for them and create yes. uh, uh, new career paths but hello 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 the root cause is that we have an entire world that uh, regards the feminine energy as less important, as less valuable, as less um, interesting, as less... Um, useful. As le- less useful than the masculine. And that is the root cause of the problem. Yes, I and love it. We, yeah, and before we, we, we um, heal that root cause in ourselves and in our societies and in our business life, we are not going to change. Wow, I, wow. So um, 
I love that you've come to the root cause because the rest of it are really symptoms of the cause. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with a lady called Rianne Eisler. Have you heard of her, Rianne Eisler? Just the chalice and the bleed? Yes. Yeah, I just recently heard it, but she's the same thing. She also, and exactly like you're echoing, is that um, it's it's the... Um, the, as the feminine has been so undervalued and we live in a, in a um, dominance society, like a dominance equal, um, ec- economy that dominates. And so the feminine, which is softer, does, it doesn't fit into that. And so this is what I want to explore with you today. So because of that, I feel as women, we have forgotten what it's like to be feminine. We don't actually know what it is. We look at femininity in relation to what we are told is traditionally a woman, right? She cooks well. She looks pretty. She's a good mother. But that's not what I understand by feminine. So what, what is feminine? What does being divinely feminine mean for us women? Well, I think you're right that most women don't really know. It's difficult to put your finger on because it's so um, unconscious. But um, it's actually quite simple because the feminine is just the other superpower. So everything in the world consists of two main energies, two main essences, the masculine and the feminine. It's a little bit more, it's a little bit easier to understand if we, if we take the Asian term, yin and yang. And it's a little bit more neutral for us to understand. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the yang energy is the outward going energy, like the sun's rays. And the yin energy is the inward, the magnetic energy, like the, the moon's pulling power, magnetic power. Mm. So, so it's, just, it's just one part of, of, the, of it's one of the, the two main essences. And if we looked at it that way, we would organize everything differently because we would, we would know that in every system there needs to be an equal an equal amount of yin and yang. Or the dyna- it's always shifting a little bit. The dynamic is not like it doesn't have to be 50-50, but there has to be an attention to an awareness of that in any system that has too much of one energy will go out of balance. Yeah. Because the two energies also keep each other, uh, they keep each other on track. So if one energy is weak, let's say the feminine energy is weak, it also weakens the masculine energy because it, it gets into overdrive and out of balance. So it's not good for the masculine either. Mm-hmm. And the same thing if there's too much masculine energy that the feminine is, and the feminine is suppressed, we go out of balance. Mm-hmm. So it's just uh, uh, one of our main essences that's plain and simply. So then we can explore a little bit more. So what is the feminine all about? And what, what, what else is the, the, the characteristics of the feminine energy? And, and, and you will get different answers uh, uh, according to who you ask about this. If you ask an acupuncturist, a Chinese acupuncturist, he will define yin in, in one way. And if you ask somebody else, they will define it another way. So it's not that there's like one, one truth written in stone. But we can say that I think an essential one for us to be aware of in these days is that there's no reason to chase or uh, think that we have to use so much effort to uh, gain what we want to gain because if we if we listen to uh, nature and if we listen to our our inner core there's so much that can be accomplished that is actually miraculous that can be accomplished with much less effort so if we over employ one energy like that outward going energy and miss out on the magnetic energy, we, we work way too hard and achieve way too little because we, we, we don't use one of our superpowers. So another thing to be aware of these days is that um, as women, uh, or the, the feminine is actually directly connected to the feminine creative principle. And we have, uh, the feminine has, is, is the life-giving and life-bearing aspect. So it's, it's directly in alignment with creation. So we have the, the feminine is, a, is an enormous creative power. It can actually manifest life, new life. Yeah. So um, that is also a very important part of feminine. Um, also being in touch, in alignment with with um, 
with the divine mother you could say to to listen to listen and and, and the mother earth is also something that the feminine is just designed to have so intuition uh, the mystical the, the hidden powers that i think that it's 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 not it's not difficult to understand how the feminine got uh, in was underestimated because the it has a marketing problem because the masculine is so visible mm. it's like you can see the masculine I mean, we talked about, the penis discussion was about our humongous microphones that we were like both having between our legs. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> but it's very I visible. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 very, it's very tangible and visible. It's everything you can measure. You can see it. It's very visible. So it's, so it's obvious to see what the masculine is able to do. And that's why we honor it and cherish it. Because when a plot comes up from the from the earth, we can see, wow, this, you know, amazing yeah. thing. How you know, uh-huh. like it's outward going. We cherish it, we celebrate it because it's just so fantastic. We can see the result, we can reap the results. But what we don't see is that underneath mm. the earth is this, um, this maturation, this like the seed is maturing. And if without it maturing, the, 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 the plant couldn't keep, even come up, but we don't see that. Mm. So we, it's easier to ignore. And the same thing with, Feminine, the, the, the feminine, um, this feminine uh, glue between us, you know, energy, you know, how yeah. you can color the energy with empathy or compassion or with love. We don't see that. We can feel it if we pay attention, but we don't really see it. So it's easy to forget it and dismiss it as something, well, everybody can do that. Mm. Nothing particular about that. But... It's it's very very it's a very important feminine skill to be able to cover the room with your energy. Yeah, definitely. I wonder. Um, I wonder if it's also a matter of that we've made economics God. You know, we've sort of in society we've made economics everything everything has to be about money like it gets it gets it gets to the stage where you know you can't do things out of pleasure anymore so if you just feel like doing something like you know oh, i'll give you a perfect example of this a friend of mine's a photographer and he does a mentorship program at a young man is still a boy in school so his mentorship program and he goes out before school and he takes photos loves mm-hmm. it just really loves it and he takes these really great photos of surfers and he shows the surfers and then he gives it to them. He's like, you know, this is my gift to you. I want to, you know, because he's on the beach. And the, he was doing a presentation and the adults in the room said to him, well, are you charging them for it? And he goes, no, like, I just want to give, well, you know, you need to get, how are you going to make money out of this? This kid's 12 years old, right? And it's the, in the sense that, like, we can't, I feel like um, unless, it has a usefulness to make money, then it's not considered worthwhile. And I wonder if that's the reason we've disregarded the feminine as well, because we're measuring everything or valuing everything by the amount of money it can make us. Yeah, I think you're right, because we have not, well... It's because we, we don't put value on um, on the on the feminine. So it, it's also like a, mm. what's the word comes first, the hen and the egg. Because if we valued the feminine, we would pay a lot more for uh, feminine for jobs that uh, employ feminine skills. For example, here in Denmark now, the discussion is because now we see with the Corona crisis, we see. Wow, what heroes! All these nurses, all these uh, people who do care work. I mean, they are like, like they're life saving, and they risk their lives to save other people's lives. So we really got our eyes open to something that we regarded as just you know anybody can be a nurse. I mean, it's not, it doesn't take that much. You, you know, you go to school a couple of years, and then you can be a nurse. You know, learn some technical skills. But there's a very big difference mm-hmm. between being a nurse from technical skills and being a real nurse, <laughs> which is about nurturing. Yes. <laughs> and now we're discovering, wow, wow, these people are heroes. They're amazing. But we never paid them very much because we didn't value the, the feminine. But 
And we, we actually see the tendency, and I think we see that all over the world, every time an area becomes infused with a lot of women, it loses uh, value. The pay gets less. Mm. So we see that in the area of, you know, uh, lawyers, we see it in the area of doctors, you know, that it, it gets less valuable every time it becomes a woman's job. So, wow. so it's, because we, it's, it's because we don't value the power of the feminine, so it's, it's actually a bit sad. But I think that will change because now we, with the, 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 I would almost say the gift of the corona crisis, um, the gift is that it has put the world to a halt and we have seen that no amount of money can, um, can save you from uh, the ability, you know, can, can, can save you from if your breathing gets restricted. Mm. That's not the money that's going to, that's going to determine whether you survive or not. I mean, Boris Johnson was just, just came out of hospital from the intensive, you know, the, the, the yeah. British prime minister. And he was like, hallelujah for the people who saved me because he was, he was, he was scared. Yeah. He really had a scare. Like I could have died from this. Um, and that, that, you know, this whole crisis, this whole halt and where we really see what's really important, our relationships, our ability to be with ourselves, to be alone, to be in good company alone, um, our ability to care for each other, to take care of ourselves, our ability to, to, to be comfortable with stillness, with pause, mm-hmm. with seemingly nothing happening our ability to be comfortable with I'm not producing or I'm not getting my, uh, I'm not getting my daily dose of appreciation because of my performance, my ability to perform. I'm not getting that this, these days because uh, I'm stuck at home. Yeah. Right. So, so that is altering a lot. And we, we're, we, we're seeing what's really important. And actually there's a, there's a stat, statistics show that what is it that get, gets people through crisis? And it's not the masculine abilities, it's the feminine. Because that nurtures our heart. Yeah. It's not, it's not our rational mind that gets us through crisis. Yes, it's useful, absolutely useful. And it's absolutely useful that there are some people who say, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and start doing something. Absolutely useful. But what gets, pe- what gets people through, what, 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 what keeps moral high, what, what gets people, what gives people the energy to cross that bridge in a crisis is the feminine. So I think that when we come out of this crisis, we will have a different relationship with them. Well, I, I'm not sure I share your optimism in the sense that um, the leaders will value feminism, feminism more. What I want us to do as women is to start, and I mean, I, I speak predominantly to women um, because I still feel that the feminine qualities are associated with women, um, even though we all have them. What I would love to see, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is how we as women ourselves can start appreciating the feminine more come from a place of feminine and not return back into that rat race because sure um, nothing to this scale has happened right and it does create a real opportunity I acknowledge that and yet what I've seen in the past and what we've all seen is it's been a crisis Um, everyone's like oh my god everyone binds together the crisis is over things go back to status quo and I really want us to to avoid that by now stepping into our feminine so how can we as women start showing more appreciation for our feminine and start showing up as that feminine fierce feminine woman I mean uh, I want to say that I actually share your perspective it's not that I think this, this uh, transition to a more feminine future is going to happen automatically. Absolutely not. The world, here, here's the thing, the world will never get into balance between masculine and feminine before women. Yes, sister. Get, Amen. Get, be, 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 <laughs> before women uh, get access to and honor and, and really employ their feminine skills. It's not going to happen. So you're so right that? about that. Like, how do we do that? Like, how do we well, do that? Well, it's... 
I think first step is to get aware of it. So your your show and and and, and my books and podcasts and this that and the other is is an important step to to wake up mm. and become aware of what is it costing us to underestimate and undervalue and suppress the feminine, and what do we have to gain by uh, by investing in discovering uh, becoming familiar with. Uh, awaken uh, even uh, make strong make strong and strengthen the feminine power within us what, what I mean that, that is that is very important uh, foundational step and how do we do that well a good step is to start uh, feeling the you know really really allowing yourself to feel what it costs you to uh, suppress the feminine because it, it has a huge price. Mm. It has a huge price on our health, hormonal system, for example. We can't stay juicy all life long if we don't honor the feminine. It's not going to happen. You're going to dry out and pretty fast. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it costs a lot of women their fertility already. It costs enormously in our relationships. We cannot have uh, healthy relationships when we don't have a healthy relationship to the feminine. We can't stand up in a relationship and be, you know, soft and open and strong. We can't. We can't put up our boundaries. We get abused. We allow ourselves to be abused. Um, we cannot um, fully love. I mean, the, our capacity for love is so enormous, but we can't use that if we don't have access to the feminine. Um, at work, we work way too hard. Totally. Way, way too, too little, hard. <laughs> way too hard, and we exhaust ourselves. And again, come back to the feminine, feminine hormonal system. We exhaust our hormonal system, so that's going to make us suffer in so many ways: depression, foggy brain, uh, lack of juice, tiredness, lack of vitality. Yeah, like yeah, heart disease. I mean, so many women are overweight with heart disease now. It's yeah. crazy, right? Yeah, we actually have male male illnesses now masculine, you know, the, the illnesses that used to be for men only, we have a lot of them. And we see a rise like this in Amazing. heart disease, breast cancer, yeah. So to be aware of the, the costs is quite important because that's sort of the, the, sti- the like, okay, come on, the stimulus to wake up. The pain, and right? Be, yeah. And then to be aware of um, what's what the gain, the possible gain, and that is... There's just actually nothing to do. So there's only, 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 only more power, more satisfaction, sure. more uh, love, more compassion, more better relationships, uh, more energy, uh, the ability to work smarter, not harder. I work as a mentor for lots of female entrepreneurs and leaders. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's so fun when they add their feminine because... Many of them, you know, I work with very ambitious people. So many of them are very accomplished and have, have really gotten far, you know, both in their, in their life and in their business. And, but then, but they are exhausted. They don't, they're, they're, so, they're, they're tired of working so hard. And they also like, there's something missing. There's that little thing missing. You know, they, at a certain point, they feel that it's purpo- that it lacks purpose to just work for some random corporation to just earn more, more money. I mean, why? Mm. Um, they might also, you know, be in a crisis of some kind, you know, divorce or illness or, you know, they, they, they might have come to a halt. And then the best part is when, it, and it's so easy to help them add that feminine superpower and then they just lie. <laughs> I love and, it. <laughs> yeah, and, it, 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 you know, for me, it's like my favorite, favorite customer because, or favorite beloved to help because... It, it is like, uh, it, it, it's so easy when you, when you have a strong one wing, you know, a strong yang one, and then you add the yin wing, you know, it's like, you know, you just, everything becomes so much easier and it's so much fun. Yeah. It's so much more fun. Divine so creation, there, right? It's divine creation is both the, the yin and the yang, right? And so <laughs> uh, from what I hear you saying, and I mean, um, it's, we, when we feel inspired, we have energy. Right, so I yeah. can see the joy you have from what you do. I can see the love, and I can see you're inspired. And because you're inspired, 
you have the energy. But if we're going against our grain and we are pushing, 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 and even though we're getting financial reward, it's against our grain, we're not feeling inspired, which is in spirit, then of course we go run out of steam. But then if you get a wonderful mentor like you to show you the way, then man, we're unstoppable, right? Totally unstoppable. And what does the world need now? Question, question, question. Do we need unstoppable <laughs> people? Yes or yes? Yes or we yes. Need, and yes. So I, I have a concept I call, <laughs> I call uh, you know, I, my, some of my programs, uh, I have two uh, main programs. One of one is called Feminine Future Leader. And, and what I talk about there is, or what I teach people is to be not only a leader in the future, but of the future. No. Lead the future. Create a bright future. Because women can do that. And men can also do, but but but, but uh, what's really needed? What's really needed? I mean, men can also, but what's really needed is somebody who focuses on the light and and who are in alignment with the the higher purpose, Mother Earth yes. and, and divine, the, the, right? The divine Mother. So, I mean, women's feminine future leadership is is even more important mm -hmm. because we are so aligned. Because it's, uh, and I also talk about illuminary leadership with for top executives, right? Who really want to to uh, to uh, I mean, take a much larger uh, leadership for a much larger commu community. And um, what's fun is that people think, well, they, if they have to undertake a larger leadership, like really, you know, really going for altering the organization or really going for creating something new or creating a bigger business on a higher level, on a bigger scale. Many, many women hold themselves back because they think that it's going to be um, a lot more work. But... But here's the wonderful news. If you employ your feminine skill, it's going to be a lot more fun and a lot easier and a lot less work and a lot, you know, a lot more rewarding. So actually, it's interesting that we've had such um, uh, resistance towards this because there's nothing to lose. There's only to gain. Oh, I love that, actually. There's nothing to lose, only to gain. And yeah. what, what I love about what you're saying there. Um, I suppose the fear comes in, especially with it, with those high level executives. I suppose for everyone, but I suppose because I used to do executive coaching as well, and um, because it's traditionally been such a masculine environment, you know, it's been a very. It's in my experience with the clients I worked with, it's very cutthroat, as you said exactly right in the beginning. It was a competition who can be the better man, right? And it's giving women or um, it's women allowing themselves the permission to stand in the feminine. And not only that, I feel it really must be a commitment, like an absolute commitment to I am not going back. And I may be hit with resistance and it's mostly resistance from within because I need to change my own programming because I've been programmed to think a certain way. But to commit to that for myself and for the people I lead and for, you know, the future. And I I wonder what you what you think about that. How can we make that commitment to ourselves and also in making the commitment to ourselves, understand that we are making the commitment to everybody and all of life. What do you think about that? So you're asking how can we make the, the commitment to The ourselves? commitment, yeah. How can we commit to it? Like not just, because there's been so much talk in the past, you know, I'm sure you've heard it, you're in that space, you know, that feminine leadership, blah, blah, blah. but now the time for talk is over and the time to create the new is here. And to create the new, we need a commitment to experiment because it's never been done before, right? So we need to allow ourselves that playfulness and that space to just go, hey, I'm just going to give this a go, but there has to be a commitment. How do we stop ourselves from um, making it, when it gets hard, going, oh, and going back to the status quo? Well, I think that the main ingredient is that is to not think you can or shall do this alone. I mean, the Americans have a good saying. They say that your mind is a dangerous place. Don't go there alone. <laughs> because <laughs> bad movie it's a bad movie isn't it? but because because uh the mind is full of old programming mm. 
And what we are needed now is not the mind. We need to lead from the soul, from the heart. So I would say two things. If you feel any kind of calling, if you feel like the slightest calling to do something different, to go for that, you know, if you, if you really feel the slightest calling to, if you, if you can sense there's something more, there's something, you know, I could do something different with my life. There's something calling me. If you feel the slightest call, listen closely. Mm. And put yourself in an environment with somebody else who can see your light mm. and who can help you brighten it and who can help you get rid of everything that stops you from shining fully. Mm. So get help. And uh, you can get help from a mentor, but what I find that the most effective is actually, uh, and this is why I create a longer, you know, I say it takes nine months to be reborn as a leader of the new era. Oh, yes. Because, uh, yeah, because I feel that it's, it is a process. Yeah. It's not something that happens overnight. So I think all these weekend courses, and so it's a good kickstart. But if you really want the transformation, you have to uh, in, be immersed in that transformational energy for, for a while. You know, it's sort of like uh, going into a lab and be transformed from caterpillar to, to butterfly. It, it takes a little time. And what's really useful is to be in a, in a safe, loving, nurturing environment with other pioneers, with other imaginal selves. Because then when you feel like stopping, there's somebody to hold you and say, I'll help you over that little bump on the road. Don't you worry. Because we're, oh, we are going, we all, I mean, I, I always tell people when they enter here, right, and they want to go here. So what's the gap? And so on the way upwards, uh, they will encounter everything that, that hinders them from being there in the first place. So fear, doubt, worry, it's going to show up on the way. And if they're on their own, that's when they're going to return to the start and say, well, it wasn't that important. But if you are in an environment with somebody who's pulling you, so that's my job. I pull people, I push people, and I help them gently over all the bumps in the road, and then they get there. So is it, it's about giving yourself the best uh, possibility. It's like a mother. You don't expect a child to come to earth and then just figure it out on its own. You need a mother. You need a family. You need a village to help you. Uh, so it's the same thing now. We, we need, we're newborn in this uh, feminine era, and, 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 and we are up against a lot of resistance from the old because that's what I see a lot with my feminine leaders or my female leaders, they come from corporations and they're exhausted because they're trying to be authentic in an environment that doesn't promote that. So when it comes to me, they're like about to quit if they haven't quit already. And I'm like, hold on, hold on. Don't quit just right now. Let's see what we can do where you are first. Because I am a little bit sorry that a lot of uh, women are, you know, actually women are leaving uh, corporations in droves. And what's good about that is that it makes corporations see well, maybe there's something we could adjust now that our most creative talent is all, are all leaving. So the good thing about that is that, that it makes corporations aware that there's something that needs to be adjusted. But what's not so good about it is that who is going to alter corporate life yeah. if all the creative talent, all the innovators are leaving? So I try to uh, invite, uh, invite women to, 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 to stay and become change makers mm. uh, in, the, in, the, in this era of this great, great shift. Stay a little bit and, and, and uh, see what we can make happen. And if, if you can't make it happen with all the support and nurturing and network you get, we can look at, you know, yeah, you have to teach your company that you will, you will change a company if, 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 it doesn't, uh, if it's not open for your innovative thoughts. But, but give them a chance. Yeah, and I love that. I, I suggest that it's a lifelong journey. Like, it's a lifelong process. So, um, once again, I feel that such a, um, we live in a world where it's like, All right, I'm doing this course, bam, it's done. Yeah, I'm done with that shit. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is the joy of it. It's the continuous growth and welcoming the challenges and absolutely reaching out to coaches and mentors and really um, investing in yourself. Like, yeah, I know this is such a, um, 
I always feel like we've said those words so often. I don't know if it, what's it like in Denmark, but here in Australia and in sort of the surrounds, it's just, oh, invest in yourself, you're worth it. And, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, 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 sure. But what women consider investing themselves maybe is getting their nails done or getting their hair done. But no, 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 no. Investing in yourself is really getting down and dirty with you. Like, and there's no greater pleasure and equally no more challenging experience than coming back to self and unpacking because that can be painful and well in my experience I mean it can be joyful too of course and you know but I think it's both sides and and until we truly honor ourselves I find and truly invest in ourselves and reach out to wonderful people like you and the other amazing coaches out there to change by yourself is really, I find is really difficult because you, you have to bring the unconscious into the conscious mind, right? And that's hard. I don't know. I don't know if you've been able to, you know, how do you find that? I find it really challenging. <laughs> but, but, you know, uh, it's so much easier for someone outside to see your light. And I think one of the big problems for women is that they don't see their own light. Yes. We are so critical. Did you know that we have a place in our brain? I forgot what it's called, but I can look it up. It's in my <laughs> It's like a little center in the brain. No, but it's just the fascinating thing is not what it's called, but what it does. does and it the does. thing is about this, this, this part of this little center in the brain, it processes, right? It processes, it processes details. So it's constantly like, what happened there? What did she mean? What, was, that, was that a negative tone? What, was she trying to make fun of me? You know, processing all the time. That center is three times as active in women as it is in men. Ah. Oh. That explains that's why after a meeting, yeah, that's after a meeting, that's why after a meeting, you know, men can say, well, that went well. And a woman can say, well, I'm not so sure. What about, what about that? And what about that detail? And did she mean that? And what did she mean by that tone of voice? Mm. And it's not because a man was oh, overly critical. It's a freaking biological thing. And it's a good thing because it makes us pay very much attention to details. It makes us very sensitive so we can catch what otherwise, you know, the, the, the refined energies that otherwise get dismissed. So it's a very big talent. But we have to be aware of the other side of the medal, which is that we can be overly critical of ourselves. Mm. So I think that for women, it is crucial to be in some kind of supportive sisterhood where other women can see your light and, 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 uh, and, and cheer on it, you know, and, and really uh, remind you of it every time you forget it. I mean, I start, you, you asked me before, what, why did I start doing this? And then I can tell you another motivation. It's a zillion years ago, I think it's maybe 20 years ago, or something like that. I noticed that all my well-educated, talented, beautiful, gorgeous, amazing goddess friends all had the same problem that from time to time, they would completely forget who they are and what they're good at and what's good and great about them. Completely forget, like, blackout. Like <laughs> blackout, like, oh, who am I? Am I good at anything? Am I worth a lot? You know, am I, who am I? Just, just blackout. Forgetting your great, greatness. And uh, we could spend weeks or months uh, or maybe even years in that pit, thinking we were not good enough, we're not worth worth the great love, or worth the best man, or worth the best job, or worth a good pay. We 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 could stay in that for for a long time, and many of us did, and I did myself. I've had long years of disbelieving myself and thinking I'm not good enough, and thinking I don't say you know, and comparing myself and all the works of the ego, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, and so I thought, what if we create a network, a sisterhood of women committed? I mean, the criteria for entering is that you commit to supporting each other. And I still have that criteria. I mean, no one is entering my, the sisterhoods I create without that attitude. It's not going to happen. So the attitude of we are here not to help each other, hold each other equally down, because that's the old feminine, but here to help each other, lift each other, right? So that's the attitude. And so I thought if, if we had that kind of network and everybody, every time one of us falls into that hole, that pit, the rest of us can gather around that hole and pull her up, yeah. remind her of what she's great at, remind her of what, uh, how, how, uh, 
how lovable she is or her talent, her light. They help her see her light, mirror her light. Mm. I and love that. that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, and, and that is actually, that um, I have seen how this has made thousands of women go for their dreams and realize their dreams with so much pleasure and so much faster than they otherwise would have. So it has been a huge accelerator, a huge shortcut to greater results with more pleasure and a lot more empowerment. So I, and I am sure that I don't know exactly what you're doing, but I am sure it's something of the same kind, supporting, nurturing, being like um, this, this, yeah, this nurture camp for female greatness. Yeah. And, you know, I would say whatever you do, check into one of those camps and the faster, the better. And, and actually don't look at so much at what it costs because it is worth it. Because yeah. what, comes, what comes out, of, actually you should consider it free because what comes out on the other side is the ability to earn more money and get paid better and employ your talents better and get a lot of life that will cost you a lot less. Because, you know, keeping those pitfalls, keeping those, that, that smallness in us will cause, you know, it will be so expensive in suffering. Mm. So expensive in suffering and disempowerment. And not only that, but it's also going to cost the global family a lot. Because as long as we stay small, we cannot create a great world. So go ahead. If you still want your children to have a worse life than you, because that's what's going to happen if we don't do anything. If you want your children to grow up and have a worse life for you with, with worse air, with worse, you know, not access to nature, with chaos and systems breaking down, go ahead. Go mm -hmm. ahead. Stay where you are. Don't do anything. But if, if you want to be uh, the generation, uh, be part of the solution, be the ones who altered what didn't work, the ones who healed the world, the ones who who turned the, the wheel in another direction. If you want to be part of that movement, jump on board right now. Mm. I mean, whatever, you know, Google, find something right now, sign up for something and get going at lifting yourself and others to a, a higher level because we can do this and it can be a lot, a lot of fun. It is fun. It's so satisfying. I mean, it's, it's full of pleasure. What's not to like? <laughs> Totally right. Um, and also, no, I absolutely agree with you. The sisterhood is really important. And I feel the reason many women or many of us or myself, I can speak for myself really, is the reason we don't move is because I feel, let me speak for myself, I feel when I don't move, when I stagnate, I feel unsupported. I feel unsafe. And having the girls in the camp, as I call it, and going, hey, you can totally do this. Like, you know, we've seen you do this. You've got this. Having your cheerleaders there and to, just to speak life into me is just amazing. And so I totally agree with that. And, um, and also I want to acknowledge that part of the patriarchal system, it's a very individualistic system. It's all about, you know, going out for yourself. What's in it for me? That question, what's in it for me? It's been so prominent in our society, but now it's shifting away from that and coming more to us, what's good for us, you know, and that's what conscious business is. It's the partnership economy, working together with each other, with the environment, with everything to create a better quality uh, world for all of us. And my beautiful Russian friend Olga said to me the other day, the question she always asks herself is, what quality of life do you want to live? Not how much money do you want or you know, whatever. What quality of life do you want to live? And then decide that and build that. Because, you know, it's, it's, for some people it's time with kids, for some people it's adventure, whatever that is for you. Ask yourself that question, define that for yourself and then find the sisterhood to support you in that. Because I feel without a vision, without an idea of where you want to go, you just, I find making decisions and having that stamina to follow through is very, very difficult. Yes. It is, it's true. You need a vision. Yeah, absolutely. You need a vision. But 
the the vision is is quite easy to get if you just listen to your longing. Mm. There's a longing in your heart. What do you long for? And so, if you really pay attention to that, maybe write it down. What about what was my what is my wish list? What is my desire list? What is what is it? What is it that I really dream of? If you if you if you if you pay attention to that, you will have a GPS. So, so it's not that difficult, but we just have to allow ourselves. And I agree with you, a lot of people don't allow themselves because they, they are stuck in the mindset that I don't deserve better and I'm not good enough and I'm not the kind of person who can go for her dreams and I'm not the kind of person who can realize her dreams. But we are all born with that ability. Mm-hmm. I mean, we are, it's such an equal world in that sense that we all have that creative ability within us. And we live in a society now that has to be recreated from scratch because it's falling down. So now we have to, uh, we can't go back to the old. We have to make it, an, an, not a restart, but a new start. Totally. Who wants yeah, to go totally. back to the old? The old's so boring, well, right? <laughs> well, it's, it's not that it's, well, I think that if a lot of people, if people could, they would, because it's easier, it's more easier. comfortable. Yeah. I mean, we, none of us really like change. You know, I work with transformation, to be honest with you. Every time big change comes to my life, Mm, it's not that I, you know, it's not, you know, I'm like, my first initial reaction is, ah, really? Do I have to? I mean, it's, it, 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 it really, and, 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 and uh, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre, but, but uh, change doesn't always come voluntarily. And, right. and I really speak from experience because the biggest changes for me has happened out of crisis. So the real transformation has happened out of crisis. So even crisis is something to be welcomed. Because it's it, it's a window. It's like I have this concept, the crisis window, right? Because it's a window of opportunity. It's a crazy, it's, it's a window that opens up to new possibilities. But often we don't want to really enter a new door if we don't have to. I because, know, of course. It's because so because we have our comfort zone <laughs> and we like that. You know, we know how it works, and it's not. Yes. It's, it's it, it looks like it requires a lot less effort to stay in the comfort zone. The problem is that you miss out on so much by staying in your comfort zone. You miss out on all that is possible and all that wants to happen. Mm-hmm. We, we are born to evolve. We, we have that, you know, we're here to learn. This is earth school, right? So we have that innate, we have that innate building. It's in our design to evolve, to explore, mm-hmm. to expand, to open up. So allow that. And I know that for some people that that is, this might sound really like to work much of a big step, but then listen more to this podcast, you know, with all the other interviews and you'll be immersed in, the, in this thought, for, in, you know, in this new kind of mindset. And, and I think at a certain point, you will feel pulled to make that first step yourself and say, okay, now I've heard all these other women and I've listened to all these guests on this, this podcast and I've written, <laughs> I have, uh, you know, I have written, you know, read all your blogs. And so now I'm going to do it. At a certain Hi, point, you will get ready. Yeah. I do. And, read- and if not before, when you've suffered enough, that's the good time. I know, right? Did I read on your website that you had a child that passed away with cancer? Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. And it, was that a a moment of crisis for you that invited you to change? Mm-hmm. I, you know, other people talk about before and after uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, for me, it's before and after. The timeline, the difference is between before and after my son died, mm. because uh, it's a radical shift, radical shift of consciousness. I would say radical shift. Um, before I was, uh, um, I would say I had a very optimistic, uh, happy-go-lucky. Uh, you can you know, go for your dreams, you know, a little bit of an, sort of, not an Anthony Robbins attitude, but a little bit of that kind of optimism. You can, you can, you know, let's go for it. We can create anything. Yeah. Um, and uh, really have, have, you know, spent many years teaching leadership, and feminine leadership, 10 years. Having a goddess school, a million, I even had a millionaire school, you know, teaching women to, to earn more money and have more time at the same time. I was very successful. I was considered sort of a role model, you know, I was in all the media and 
in Scandinavia. I wrote, I don't know how many books. I wrote a book called Motherhood as Career Booster. I wrote a book called Father, The New Career Dad. I was like, uh, I was not aware that, uh, I had this mindset, if, if you have enough will and you want something, you can make it happen. I was listening to these American coaches saying, you know, there's nothing you can't be, do, or want, uh, or have. You can't, there's nothing you can't be, do, or have. So I was like, I didn't believe it perhaps 100%, but I was like going for, you know, I was living my life in alignment with that philosophy. Yeah. So unstoppable, um, enjoying the possibilities of life, regarding all obstacles as a little bump on the road to just be past. And then... Suddenly, actually, in the middle of my high success, when I had just launched my international global goddess leadership program and gathered women from 10 countries, even one from New Zealand, can you believe it? We came all the way to Copenhagen to participate in, the, in my leadership training. Wonderful. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, no, so, so really for me, like a miracle that I could make, you know, people came from Canada, from different parts of Europe, from, from New Zealand. I mean, how crazy is that? So, um, I just launched that and, and just filled that program. And then my six-year-old son complains that he has a little bit of pain in the side of the chest. And that's very strange for a six-year-old, right? So we went to the doctor four times. And the doctor uh, said, no, that's nothing. Don't worry about it. But then, you know, after we, we, we thought, this, this, we don't like this. Let's, let's check this. So we took him to the hospital. Turned out he had a six six centimeter by eight centimeter tumor wow. from the left pneumon. And uh, to make a very long story short, I thought in the beginning, this is just a test. This is a test. Do all my fantastic methods work? You know, all my leadership training. You know, I, I thought this is, a t I thought it was devastating, of course, but I was sure that this was just uh, a, uh, a test for me to demonstrate that all my feminine, alternative holistic principles worked. So, uh, so what I did was I, I, I employed those, you know, I, I focused on the vision, you know, even with the hospital said he's actually, his cancer is not only highly aggressive, it's also incurable. They gave him 0% survival chance. Zero, like zero. And even that didn't stop me. I was like, miracles, that is my specialty. Watch me. So I focused, you know, on that little, little, little percentage. I mean, the 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 beyond zero that I could see. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. I mean, hello. You know, talking about being a visionary. Uh, and actually, I did manage to cure him from the cancer. He did not die of cancer. I found a very innovative method that actually healed his cancer. So you know, you could see the the. the tumor was gone there was no more pain but the problem was that that method that particular method um where you actually get the tumor to commit suicide mm -hmm. it, it, when it does it, it it started bleeding out in the lungs and uh, the danish hospital did not believe that we had cured the cancer because that was outside of their mind it was outside of their paradigm yeah. they did not believe it so when i said would you please help me with the side effects of this. Will you please empty his lungs for blood? They refused. Oh, wow. Because they did not believe that I had, they thought I was a crazy mother. They were like, let him die in peace. You know, we told you for six months he's incurable. So wow. they, did, they refused to help me. So the day after I celebrated that he was well and the cancer was gone, he died. Wow. At the age of seven years old and four months. And so that night that he died, it was like, I felt I got a cosmic fuck finger. Yeah. So much for your beliefs, so much for all that leadership training, so much for balance between the masculine and the feminine. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because uh, there is a much larger power at work. There's, uh, you know, your human will is just part of a bigger web. Mm. And um, I thought that night, okay, so 
in spite of all that I've done and all that I created and all the results I got, my life is now, if I follow the natural law of gravity, my life is going to go down the drain. And in that process, I'm going to take my two other children with me, my relationship with my husband, my whole family, and my business. It's going to go down the drain if I follow the natural law of gravity, mm. which was very tempting the night you, you, you watched your seven-year-old die. Mm. You sit with him in the hands and he breathes slower and slower and then he stops breathing. Wow. Hello. Yeah. But I took one important decision that night and that was to go up instead of down. Because I thought it's, it's too early for my other kids, they were two and two at ten, to lose hope in life. I, I don't want them to grow up not believing in the happy end. Mm. I want them to always focus on the light. I want them to remain optimistic and enjoy their lives. So I can't, I can't let this happen. I can't go down the drain. And they deserve a happy mother. Mm. And one son is in paradise. The two other sons need to be in paradise too. Mm. So I need to create paradise on earth for them. So I took one decision to go up and sit down. And I didn't know how. But I must say that that's what happened. I have had a very, very beautiful journey, not a pain-free journey. It's been very, very pain. I don't wish that pain upon anyone. It is still painful. When I, when I, when I pay attention to the pain, oh my God, it's, it's an endless pain and it will never stop. Mm. But I have also experienced that it has been an opening, an expansion, an upgrade in consciousness. I mean, a coach and mentor can only take people as far as she has gone herself. Mm. And now that I have passed the threshold, passed the threshold of death, I can see and send so much more than I could before. Mm -hmm. So I can take people so much further, so much further than I could before. I mean, there's no limits to how far I can take it because I've passed that uh, threshold of, of death. And that is... You know, I would say that is the gift that my son gave me. That is the love gift he gave me. He opened my whole universe to, to the universe, to, to, you know, to, to the dimension of soul. And that is, a, that is a completely different paradigm than the dimension of personality, which a lot of coaches work in the dimension of personality. But I work in the dimension of soul now. So all my students, they get on their soul path. And they, you know, we work with what is your soul purpose, not what is your life purpose, what is your soul purpose? And then we work on manifest that, manifesting that. And we also take the shift from the paradigm of the personality and the ego to the shift of the essence. That's what, that's what I work with. So it has been a huge, 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 enormous, humongous change. And I would say, I mean, for the much better. Mm. Because now I'm not so dependent on circumstances to be, happy, fulfilled, at ease, open, blissful. Mm. It's not the outer circumstances that determine that because I have, I, I have that already. Mm. So now I'm just doing the work. <laughs> I'm just uh, serving where I can. But uh, I'm not dependent on, on, on the outer circumstances so much. And uh, I keep experiencing this expansion of, uh, of consciousness and, and, and creativity. And it's just so much joy and so much gratitude for, for what I have received. So I always say to people, don't be so afraid of what you will lose because loss is a gain. Mm. When you let go of something, if you're open to it, and that, that requires leadership. That requires an enormous leadership. If I hadn't had the training I had given myself, practicing my leadership muscles for 10 years, I could not have done this. 80% of the people who experience this, they go down the drain. Yeah. Because it's so painful to lose a child. It's so unnatural. It's so, it is so painful. It's a future you never get. It's, it's like, it's, it's so, it goes so against all the instincts in us to lose a child. So it requires an enormous leadership, such as do other crises. Divorces, to create, to create a happy divorce or come to, to create a divorce that becomes an upgrade or a conscious divorce where you actually remain friends with your 
ex beloved that requires an enormous leadership as well. Yeah. To cure yourself from uh, a chronic disease or um, whatever is, is also requires an enormous leadership to to cure yourself from burnout or from to 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 have a child when you suffer from infertility it requires an enormous uh, leadership. So there's so many life situations that requires an enormous leadership, but we can do this. And that's the good news. So the big crisis we experience right now, well, one more opportunity to practice our leadership. And I am certain that we can go up instead of down as a culture from this global crisis. And I think we should do it. Wow, thank you for sharing so much. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I um, know that's a very deeply personal experience for you. And um, I wanted the audience to hear that because so often we can speak. You know, it's easy to talk. You know, you and I, I can tell you, you enjoy speaking as much as me. We have the gift of the gap and the gift of inspiration. And yet that life experience has really opened up your world, as you say. And you know that from pain comes gain you know maybe gain's not the right word but for me it's more like consciousness uh, an invitation to return to self and yeah sometimes it can be painful and I think the gift that programs like you and I share is that you don't have to get to that crisis point to make that change and that's really the idea is don't get to that crisis point you know take that upon yourself and go ahead and change before a crisis but um, yeah, thank you for that. And I think that's, for me, I, the, the deepest lesson was in that story for me. And I really appreciate that. And I think the audience will appreciate it too. So um, thank you. Um, so I, where can the amazing audience get hold of you and follow you and tap deeper into your wisdom and into your sisterhood? Oh, that's so nice of you to ask that. Well, if they can spell my name, <laughs> it would be quite easy for them. Kirsten Stendevant. And I know that's a Danish name, so it's a little bit difficult for them. But uh, they can also look up my company, Illumina International. I'll put all in the show notes anyway, so they can have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, uh, but um, and they can follow my podcast called Illumina Leadership with Kirsten Stendevant and they can find me on Instagram and LinkedIn and YouTube and all kinds of things. They can, uh, uh, right now I have uh, uh, something called uh, thecrisiswindow.com where I uh, give uh, my advice for getting through a crisis and it's free. And um, I give uh, like also a test where you can test yourself how equipped you are for 21st century leadership. Wow. So you can take a test and see how how equipped are you for the feminine era? Uh, wow! So, so, yeah. <laughs> I love things uh, like that. I'm so doing that when I get off this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a test that reveals to you actually your gap. You know, where do you still have some work to do in the area of balancing the masculine and the feminine and applying the new rules of the game? So it's actually it's very it's, it's a good test. Um, is that on the website? No, was that on the website, Kirsten? Or was uh, well, it has it, it right now. It's hidden under the crisiswindow.com because okay. I haven't put it directly on the website. But it, but when, I think when when your viewers will listen to this, it will be on the website because it's, okay. it's, um, it, uh, I'll it's find it and find a link for it anyway and put it on. Okay. Yeah, I'll put the link for you. Yes, it's my website. You can just see test. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So and. Uh, I uh, in the crisis I give I give uh, my best tools for for getting through a crisis because I think that crisis has come to stay. It's part of the new norm, so we better learn to cope with it. And I would be, I'm happy to give away my advice for you because it's something that that uh, you know it's it's my service uh, to 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 do that. And and also I think that a lot of one thing I really it's really important for me is that there is so much misunderstanding in the area of, of coaching and leadership where we, 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 we think that we can do anything. And that's what I learned that no, sometimes you have to, you, sometimes you have to be open to the bigger web. Sometimes it's not your own little human will that decides. Sometimes you're also part of a web, a bigger web. So I, I, I try to make people distinguish a little bit 
with, with all these information about the law of attraction and so on, well, that's one out of 20, 21 universal laws, or maybe even more. So I give people a little bit of nuances uh, with that so that they don't stumble uh, and fall like I did. I felt so enormously guilty for not being able to save my son because I believed that I had created this. So I have a whole uh, thing about that. But yeah, go to the crisisfinder.com or go to my website. And, and uh, I also, um, might be interesting for your viewers that I'm um, about to publish a book called The Future is Feminine for All of Humanity. Fantastic. Um, Tell us more. Yes. Yes. It's this book in, in Scandinavian languages, but um, it will be out in um, winter 20. Uh, or 20 no, I think when we get to January 21, it's going to come out in English. Um, and that book is a really, really good handbook. It's a good foundational handbook because it, ex it, it, it sort of tidies up in this whole thing. What's the masculine? What's the feminine? What's, what does it have to do with men? What does it have to do with women? What does it have to do with the big shift from a more patriarchal society to a more feminine society? How does that exactly look? What does that mean for women? What does that mean for men? It's, it sort of tidies up and it took me so long to write it because it's so complex. Yeah. It was really a big work, you know, and it's full of, I mean, I don't know how many, much research, you know, you can see that it's like resource after resource. I researched so much work, but when people read it, they say, ah, something clicks. Ah, okay. Okay. It becomes so simple. Great. And that was my purpose with the book. So wait for that book to come out in, in, or if you listen to this later, you know, in January 21, this, this is a very, um, it's a gift to, to help clarify this whole thing about masculine and feminine because it's, we, uh, we get a little bit lost in what's what and how do, how, do we, uh, how do we access both our masculine and our feminine and how do we balance the two. So, yeah, so there are many opportunities. And thank you so much for asking. That is, that is so uh, generous. <laughs> I could possibly interview you and not tell audiences where to get a hold of you. My goodness. Um, look, that sounds amazing. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that book coming out. And it sounds phenomenal and just a guide on, you know, how to proceed forward now. And I think that's really going to be a very powerful tool for us to, to tap into that wisdom and to take what we read and to implement that, that into our lives and to move forward and to create what we want to create so thank you for the work you've put into that because um i can just from the little bit of my own research into the feminine it is a minefield like there is so much stuff and it, honestly my head explodes right but so it's quite a relief for me to know that you've done the research and I can just wait for your book. <laughs> which is, which is, I know I did that work. It took me so long. And I, you know, on the way I thought, who gave, who, who gave me this job? This job? I, 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 I was like, I, this job is too big for me. And I was like, Oh God, it was myself who gave me that job. So there was no way around it. You're such a rock star. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for your wisdom. Um, and thank you for just sharing all of you with us today. I really appreciate that. Um, I just have one final question, which is always my favorite, um, which is what is your red hot truth and how are you living it? My red hot truth. Could be that I have a very loving relationship to my yoni, my holy lap. And then I listen to my holy lap for life guidance. So I listen to my womb and I listen to my feminine system. I have a lot of respect for her. I find that um, I'm very, very uh, grateful to be born as a woman and have access to that, to that wisdom. So that I think that, that, is, that is my secret. It's not a weapon, but it's my... Uh, it's my secret power, secret superpower that I, that I honor my holy lap and listen to her and follow her guidance. I love that. And I'm so doing some womb work because you're the second guest who's now spoken about the womb. So I'm, I'm going down there, sister. <laughs> It's so much fun, <laughs> uh, but uh, it, it's not only fun. It's not it, it's because it's it's different from just fun, and it, it is 
it is very deep work mm. you can do that, and very deep human work. I mean, we have an intelligence in our feminine design that is beyond belief. Mm. And I discovered that after my son died, and because I because I discovered that my womb was crying with me. Wow! Wow! Amrita is not just something that comes out in, in pleasure. It's also the the womb crying. You cry when you, when you experience. I mean, I was so touched by that that my womb would be so with me, so with my heart, my feminine bleeding heart, my mother heart. So I that that got me on a journey to discover all this uh, mystique. So actually, that's also why I teach my leadership training. I connect leadership with the work uh, in erotic intelligence because I think it's 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 so tied together. And if women access their erotic intelligence, their leadership has to be very different and very much more in alignment with the Divine Mother and Mother Earth. And this is what I think we need. Yes, oh, I love that. I'll have to save that for another interview, Erotic Intelligence. I love that so much. And um, just on that, I wonder if you are familiar with Esther Perel's work. Have you heard of Esther Perel? Yeah, so that also reminds me of that, um, you know, the uh, eroticism is the zest for life you experience, you know. And, um, yes, I agree with you. I think that's really the epicenter for us women. And so, um, but I'll have to be there for another podcast because I'm going to be here forever. Thank you again, Kirsten, for your wonderful time today. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you so much for inviting me. I appreciate it. See you. Bye. Well, that's a wrap, everyone. Thank you for being here with us at the Red Hot Truth Podcast. If you loved it as much as we did, please download this episode, share it with your friends, and remember to subscribe. Your time to shine is now. See you next time. Ciao, Bella.